Hello, Africa. A very good evening and a warm welcome to yet another edition of your favorite Pan-African show, Bottom Line Africa. My name is Yusuf Ibrahim. It is Wednesday, the 24th day of January 2018, a day in which Zimbabwean President Emerson Mnangagwa is in Davos, Switzerland, attending the World Economic Forum, basically telling the world to come and invest in Zimbabwe, because that is where apparently the movers and shakers of global market are based, at least that they're attending uh, that uh, forum. Once again, this is Bottom Line Africa. We'll have that story and much more in line for you. But first, let's take a look at our highlights tonight. A twin car bomb attack has left over 30 people dead and scores others wounded in the Libyan city of Benghazi. A combined team of army, some UN and other foreign missions get down on logistics to hand over security apparatus to the Somali national government. And tonight we'll be telling you why doctors in Algeria have stayed away from hospitals for the last two months. And also we'll have a rich panel of discussions to weigh in on Africa's progress for advancing human rights. Of course, the program begins right now. On our Twitter poll tonight, we are asking you, are you satisfied with Africa's progress in securing human rights? Are you satisfied with Africa's progress in securing human rights? Our Twitter handle is at KTN News. You can as well tweet me at Yusuf Ibra. The hashtag is bottom line Africa. Remember that tweet is what is going to form the basis of our discussion tonight. I'm going to interview... We have, a power, a power, we have a power panel tonight. I'm going to talk to Winnie Biajima, who is the Oxfam Executive Director. And then we also have in studio George Kegoro, Executive Director at Kenya Human Rights Commission, as well as Fiseha Tekle, who is an Amnesty International official on Ethiopian program. Remember, Ethiopia just the other day released a couple of political detainees. Many people are now questioning, is that a way, you know, a positive move? Uh, from the Haile Mariam government. We'd like to hear your view on that topic. But for now, let's begin with our top story tonight. And now, Rwandan President Paul Kagame is among the African leaders who are already in Davos, Switzerland, to attend the annual World Economic Forum. Now, Kagame is the only African leader scheduled to meet U.S. President Donald Trump on the sidelines of the forum. White House sources say that President Trump hopes to seize the opportunity to reaffirm U.S.-Africa relations in light of his recent comment. And President Kagame is the current chairman of the African Union, that is the AU, according to a schedule released by National Security Advisor H.R. McMaster. The meeting will take place on Friday. The two leaders will also be expected to discuss shared priorities including trade and security the african union has called on trump to apologize for his what they said or they refer to as contemptuous remarks well let's now cross over to your favorite segment where we're going to give you all the top stories happening in the region that is of course uganda rwanda as well as tanzania Hello there. Let's get right into it now. Rwanda's President Paul Kagame has hit out on Africa's critics who solely believe that the peace-building processes in the continent can be solely found through external solutions. The Rwandan head of state who was speaking on the sidelines of the ongoing World Economic Forum underway in Davos, Switzerland, said that there is a lot of importance in Africans owning the solutions to their problems. Based on personal experience, President Kagame said that imported and imposed solutions do not serve the purpose to address local challenges. You cannot import solutions from outside and impose them on people and expect them to work. It cannot. I am speaking from experience, he said. Giving the example of Rwanda, President Paul Kagame said in the peace-building process, Rwanda had to understand its problems and owned its solutions. There is no miracle performed in Rwanda. We understood that owning our problems is very important to us as Rwandans. We owned our solutions and were open-minded to other options, but there is absolutely need to own the processes, he said. The ongoing forum in Davos, Switzerland, is running under the theme creating a shared future in a fractured world. 
Elsewhere, the Board of Directors of the Rwanda Utilities Regulatory Authority, Rura, has approved the accusation of Tigo Rwanda by Airtel Rwanda. Therefore, in such a move, it means that all the shares of Millicom International, that is for Tigo, have now been moved to Airtel Rwanda. A statement signed by the head of legal and economic regulation at the regulatory body, Rura, assured local Tigo subscribers that the acquisition shall not affect the existing subscribers of Tigo Rwanda, but rather it is expected to bring industry stability, improved quality of services, and product innovation for the benefit of the consumers. The existing subscribers of Tigo Rwanda will continue to be served seamlessly during and after the consolidation. Subscribers will not be required to change their existing Tigo telephone numbers and existing Tigo cash services will not be affected. This statement read in part. Now that the accusation has been given a green light by the regulator here in Rwanda, that now means that the Rwandan market will have two players, the merged entity and MTN Rwanda. Of course, you'll be wondering what is taking place in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. Here is Rajabu Hassan with all the details. Taasisi ya moyo ya Jakaya Kikwete ni taasisi peke ya moyo nchini Tanzania. Inaotoa huduma kwa wagunjwa wa matatizo ya moyo. Na taasisi hii inapanga kutoa huduma zaidi kwa wagunjwa wa moyo kutoka kote Afrika Mashariki. Nania yetu ni kwamba kuhakikisha kila mtanzania anapata huduma bora ya moyo. Na tunakwenda mbele zaidi sasa kwa nchi za Afrika Mashariki na Kati, Rwanda, Burundi na sehemu zingine zote ili tuweze kuwahudumia watu watoto wote wenye shida ya matatizo ya moyo waweze kutibiwa hapa. Taasisi ya Save a Child Hearts tangu mwaka 1999 imefanikiwa kutibu watoto wenye matatizo ya moyo zaidi ya sita kutoka kote Tanzania bara na Zanzibar. Na mradi huu unafanywa na madaktari bingwa kutoka Ujerumani na Israel kwa ushirikiano na madaktari kutoka taasisi ya moyo ya Jaka ya Kikwete ambapo mradi umeokoa gharama ambazo zingetumika kuwapeleka nje kwa matibabu watoto wenye matatizo ya moyo. Um, Save a child's heart to date has saved the lives of more than 4500 children for 55 countries around the world. We are very proud of all our partnerships. We are very proud of the program we have with our Palestinian neighbors, but I, I must confess and admit that the program here in the JKCI under the leadership of Professor Janabi and a very devoted and committed team here of doctors, technicians and nurses, this is the top program. This is the most successful program of Save a Child's Heart worldwide. Madaktari wa Tanzania wamenufaika na mradi huu kwa kupata nafasi ya mafunzo watakayoyatumia kwa ajili ya kutoa huduma kwa watoto kutoka kote Afrika Mashariki. Rajabu Hassan KT News, Dar es Salaam. Now over to the south of the continent, and that is in South Africa. South Africa's graft-tainted President Jacob Zuma on Tuesday, that is yesterday, announced a probe into corruption at the highest levels of the state after Parliament indicated it will this week deliberate procedures for impeachment. Now corruption allegations have tarnished Zuma's image as well as eroded his support uh, Bez, and he was ordered last month to appoint a judicial inquiry into the alleged graft within 30 days. The beleaguered leader has faced growing pressure to resign before even his term as president expires in 2019. Uh, Zuma's announcement comes the day before parliament is to take up a draft of a process of removing or for removing the nation's president from office. The allegations must be investigated properly and thoroughly so that the findings that the Commission will make and the recommendations that it will make will be findings and recommendations that are a product of a proper investigation and of a thorough investigation. The absolute priority for me is this Commission. But one accepts that there might be some time that lapses between the establishment of the commission and when the commission starts, for example, uh, the hearing of evidence.
Let's now cross over to the Horn of Africa and Somalia, to be specific. The federal government of Somalia, in conjunction with the African Union mission in Somalia, well known as AMISUM, the United Nations, the European Union and other key international partners have established a transition core group which is tasked with the responsibility of developing a transitional plan for Somalia. Now headed by the National Security Advisor to the President, the transition core group's terms of reference include assisting the transition or with the transition approaches and delivering a draft transition plan by March this year. Now, the group whose primary objectives will be to assist the president and the prime minister take the lead in the transition process is expected to deliver, quote-unquote, realistic, fast and condition-based transition with feasible debts for the transfer of the national security responsibility from AMISOM to the Somali security forces. AMISOM has already begun to scale down its operation after 10 years stint to try and stabilize the country that was riddled by war and insurgency. Over to the west of the continent now and the most populous country in Africa, that is Nigeria. Nigerian police on Tuesday briefly detained activists calling for the release of the Chibok school girls kidnapped by Boko Haram jihadists nearly four years ago. Now, members of the hashtag Bring Back Our Girls advocacy group were taken into custody as they held their daily demonstrations in the capital, Abuja. The coordinator, Aisha Yusufu, uh, says that uh, it has, they have been calling rather on the government to rescue or secure the release of scores of girls abducted from the remote northeastern town of Chibok in April 2014. It also wants the return of thousands of other women, men and children who have been seized during the conflict which began in 2009 and has killed at least 20,000 people. About 12 people were taken into custody around 10 a.m. and were held at an Abuja police station for approximately four hours. Uh, the group that, that is according to the group leader, Obi Ezekwesili. We came today for, to, for our usual match. We did our usual procedures like informing the police. But when we were here and were about to leave, they barricaded Unity Fountain and said we weren't going anywhere. They said they had orders from the IGL police or who, wherever they said they, they did get the orders from that we were to be confined to the Unity Fountain. But that's against the law because the um, Constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria guarantees us free freedom of movement in the first place. Well, some of our members were dragged uh, on, on the floor. Uh, so, so, some, some of them had their phones taken away and then some of them were threatened. There was a particular member, uh, a policeman who said he was going to shoot one of our members. And then our, some of our equipment, our sand equipment were broken by the Nigerian police force. Been, we've, been, we've been attacked, we've been maligned, we've been physically attacked by the Nigerian police force. This is not the first time. In 2014, the Nigerian police force, force attacked BBOG. So it happened in 2018, again, it's something that we are used. Over the years, we have seen the police come at us, attack us, injure us, and, 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 and all of that. So tomorrow, again, we are, we, are, we are doing our matches, and then we'll continue with our daily sit the way we've always done. Now, the death of South African jazz legend Hugh Masekela has triggered an outpouring of tributes to his music, his long career, and his anti apartheid activism. Now, the charismatic horn blow and vocalist recorded songs ranged from the haunting stimula, that means, you know, a train, about trains taking uh, black workers to South Africa's mines, to the cheeky energy of Thanai about large women struggle with food. Tributes have been pouring in following his death yesterday at the age of 78, following complications related to prostate cancer. Among those who have paid tribute is yet another South African musical legend, Sifo Mabuse. There was a time when there was so much focus on South, Afri on South Africa um, because of its politics and um, Naturally, culture would also play a very significant role, and there were all these musicians who, who took part in in the liberation struggle, and Hugh was one of those musicians who were in the forefront. Hugh was always longing for an influence from somewhere, as you as most of his music would attest. You know, having gone to uh, to Nigeria, having gone to Ghana, he was always this curious musician of. Uh, spreading his wings. I mean, there was no kind of music that you would not interact or play, play to. 
I was fascinated by Brahu's energy as an older musician who was already turning 77. Uh, his ability to to make himself available to work with young musicians, and 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 he he was never a kind of snobbish musician. You know, seasoned musicians are often um, can be a bit um, aloof and not available to people who make music without musical. Understand. He was the epitome of South African jazz. He was the father of, of South African jazz. He was world renowned. Um, you know, what can you say? An absolute legend. Um, everything from King Kong to Stimula to the jazz epistle. I was really grateful to have seen him and Abdullah Graham on stage the last time. As a young person, you, Masekela, pursued his dreams of being an artist, and that enabled him to be an activist. Uh, using music in terms of spreading the message about the plight of the people that were oppressed by the apartheid government here in South Africa. Now, over to the North Africa and several hundred resident doctors who have been on strike for two months in Algeria organized a sit-in on Tuesday at the main hospital in Algiers on the eve of negotiations with the government. Now, Algeria's doctors have continued their strike until further notice following weeks of protest in the country after a sit-in calling for better working conditions in the capital Algiers was dispersed violently uh, by authorities. Now, the National Office of the Autonomous Collective of Algerian resident doctors known as Kamra said in a statement that its demands were discussed with the Minister of Health, Mukhtar Hasbelawi. A number of terms were agreed to by the Minister of Health, verbally apparently, according to Kamra, which include more flexibility during civil service, the right to housing and transportation access, and better training as well. We're asking to do only one mandatory. When we cannot do the military service, we do this civil service. But from our voluntary offer, it is anti-constitutional to ask medical specialists to provide this civil service and military service, knowing that we are the only ones asked to. As for the civil service, which the second compulsory service doctors who have just finished their studies are obliged to go to practice in several regions of the country, the Sahara, the highlands, or even the coastal regions, the doctor is then alone in front of the patient without the tools necessary to exercise his profession as a doctor. Now, the Gets a Foundation will invest $45 million in nutrition and family planning programs in Burkina Faso. Now, Melinda Getz said on Tuesday during a visit to the capital, Ogadogo. Now, the bulk of the money, that is about $34 million, aims to fund programs that promote nutrition in infants and young children and improve access to healthy, affordable diets. And $10 million will be allocated to contraceptive programs uh, to help women uh, plan and space their pregnancies. Now, Burkina Faso, one of the least developed countries in the world, has great difficulty in controlling its population, which is growing at a rate of about 3% per year. Which, and uh, Melinda Getz said invest, investing in women will help to improve the lives of families. She also announced a funding initiative for contraceptives in nine African countries, among them Benin, Burkina Faso, Ivory Coast, Guinea, Mali, Mauritania, Niger, Senegal, and Togo. In the foundation that uh, we're announcing $45 million to, the, uh, to Burkina Faso government around the areas of women's nutrition, empowerment and family planning because we believe that women are the center of the family and if they lift themselves up and we make the right investments the Burkina Faso government is already doing that they lift up the rest of the family and on nutrition uh, we're involved with a partner called Alive and Thrive who's done work around the world um, to really teach women that immediately and exclusively breastfeeding their babies, again, their babies will be healthier, and uh, that they need to do that the first six months of life, and then they can start to add complementary foods, that if you do that, the baby will grow up healthier. Ms. Gert is here to show her commitment to reach the National Economic and Social Development Plan target regarding speeding up of the demographic transition and improving mothers and children's nutrition. We are thankful towards Ms. Gert for her invaluable contribution, which I hope will increase. Now, more than 30 people have been killed and dozens wounded 
after two car bombings outside a mosque frequented by jihadist opponents in Libya's second city, Benghazi. Now, the attack of took place after evening prayers on Tuesday and aligned the continued chaos in Libya, which has been wrecked by violence and division since dictator Muammar Gaddafi was toppled and killed in 2011. Now, still in Libya, military deminers are clearing mined areas in the Libyan city of Benghazi uh, where, where, loud blasts from, where loud blasts from explosives and booby traps have become an all too familiar sound. Mines planted uh, during more than three years of war in Benghazi are taking a high toll on under-equipped deminers and residents trying to return to districts where protracted battles once took place. Now, military engineers are striving to clear the explosives like mine detectors and are working with basic tools and their bare hands, apparently. Their task is painstaking and extremely, extremely dangerous. 50 have been killed and 60 wounded, according to a military source. The war in Benghazi erupted in 2014 when Libyan commander Khalifa Haftar began battling Islamist and other op opponents, part of a broader conflict that spread in Libya after the fall of Muammar Gaddafi seven years ago. Thank God we have completed some of the work, but some of it has yet to be completed due to lack of resources, bad circumstances and obstacles. Well, and that report takes us to a very short break. Of course, that brings us to the end of the first part of this program. But when we come back, we'll have our studio discussion tonight. Once again, we are talking about the record of human rights or human rights record in Africa as a continent. And on Twitter, Paul, earlier we did ask you, are you satisfied with Africa's progress in securing human rights? In studio, I'm going to have George Kegoro, the executive director, Kenya Human Rights Commission. Winnie Biajema is going to talk to me via Skype. And she is the Oxfam Executive Director. Feseha Tekle is also going to talk to me via Skype. He is, of course, representing Amnesty International Ethiopia program. All this after this very short break. Stay with us.